Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Matthews and I'll be your moderator for this Masters of Reliability webinar on P1816 implementation. As with our previous webinars, today's content builds upon our mission to extend craftsmanship mastery to circuit owners and their contractors to improve reliability. For those of you new to the Masters of Reliability webinar series, links to recordings of past webinars may be found online at www.novinium.com. Joining us today as our expert guest speaker is Mike Smalley of Wheat Energies. He holds electrical engineering degrees from both the Milwaukee School of Engineering and the University of Wisconsin. He has 20 years of electrical utility industry experience, was the past chair of the AEIC Cable Engineering Committee, and is presently the vice chair of the IEEE Task Group for P1816. Mike, welcome, and I now turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks for that kind introduction. I'd also like to ex extend my thanks to Navinium for giving me the opportunity to speak about P1816, because I know it's a very important part in making a cable system reliable. Here's a brief agenda, some of the things we're going to cover today. First, we're going to talk about what is P1816 and what it recommends as the recommended ways to prepare the different layers of a cable system. Uh, second, we'll talk about what makes reliable electrical connections. We'll also talk about what makes reliable insulation interfaces within these products. Uh, I'll follow up with some suggestions on how to implement uh, these recommendations at your utility, and then we'll cover some of the key takeaways from today. So some of our objectives, first of all, the objective I have today is that by the end of the webinar, all of those on the all of those listening will understand the fundamental steps of proper cable preparation. We'll understand how to make reliable electrical connections and how to make reliable insulation interfaces. And with all that background, you should be able to recommend, I'm sorry, you should be able to explain to an installation crew um, why these steps are in the process and why they are so critical. So with that, let's get started on talking about P1816. So what is P1816? Now, this is a draft guide that we created within the IEEE Insulated Conductors Committee. Uh, we started work on this effort in response to, to a request from an organization called the National Cable Splicing Certification Board. That entity um, certifies installers on the proper installation of electrical cable systems. So what they were looking for was a document that talks about all the critical steps within cable preparation that have all been agreed by industry experts through the IEEE. So since I had recently done a similar process within WE Energies, I volunteered to serve as the vice chairman of that task group. A few of the assumptions I've made today, uh, first I've assumed that you've seen some of the previous webinars and therefore are familiar with some of the various layers of a shield of power cables and know what their functions are. Uh, my examples are, will focus primarily on concentric neutral cable. Those are the types of cables that I am most familiar with. Uh, although there is a lot of good information in P1816, you have to understand that it is supplemental to um, the system owner's construction standards as well as the manufacturer's installation instructions. So those always must be followed as well. A little background uh, from me. My experience has been that improper installation is the most common cause of these accessory failures. So the best way to counter those failures is to make sure that everybody knows the proper way to prepare cables. My experience has been when we take apart a joint that wasn't cr installed correctly and we talk to the installer about it, um, the experience I have is that this is mainly due to improper training or lack of training. And if you'd like to see some of these examples, you may want to refer to previous webinars that Bill Taylor and Glenn Luzzi have, have put on for us. So let's get started with preparing cables. I've summarized uh, this into about five steps. First is cutting the cable. Second is removing the jacket. Most of the, jack the cables purchased uh, today have jackets. The third will be terminating or handling the metallic shield. And in our case, this will be our concentric neutral wires. The fourth step will be to score and remove the non-metallic insulation shield. And uh, the last step will be to remove the insulation and conductor shield from the conductor. OK, so let's talk a little bit about cutting the cable. The first bullet item I have is to consider when you do this, how much of the metal shield will you need for future connections? In my example, I'm showing a joint that would be installed in a manhole. And what I'm showing is concentric neutral cable that will be installed and uh, attached to a lead cable. 
So the first thing to consider is that to make this joint work properly, we're going to have enough, we're going to need to have enough metal to, to cross the entire joint and attach to the lead sheet. So this is where we would make our initial cut. And the initial cut is not critical. It's mainly just something you have to consider when it comes to the length of the metal shield. However, the final cut um, is very critical. The final cut, as you can see, is in the center of the joint. Uh, the center cut, the center location here is where our conductor of the cable will end. And this is where we're going to attach it to the existing cable. So when we make this cut, it's very important that we make the cut square. I should also point out that at this location, at this time, if the cable will not be terminated um, right at this instant, these, the cable ends should be sealed to make sure that moisture doesn't get in. But if you are going to move forward and install a joint at this time, then a, this is a good time to clean up the jacket and make sure there's no debris in there that might interfere with our steps further down the line. So what do I mean by a square cable cut? If you take a look at the picture on the left, where we actually are holding a square against the cable, you can see what we're talking about. We have a nice cut straight through that's perpendicular to the length of the cable. If you look at the other example on the right side, you'll see that the conductor has been cut at an angle. So re the reason that we're not recommending to do it this way is if you can envision installing this conductor in the connector, um, we won't have all the metal in the connector that it should have. We may have a problem with the connection. So for this reason, we recommend using a hacksaw, a bandsaw, or a reciprocating saw when making that final cut. I do avoid using the scissor style cutters because they tend to deform uh, the end of the cable and the conductor, uh, making some of these connections more challenging. Okay, now that we've had our cable cut, the next step is to remove the cable jacket. In my example, we, we're using a jacket that we can call encapsulating or extruded to fill. And what I mean by that is if you look at the diagram in the upper right, you can see how the jacket material has actually um, encompass the entire concentric neutral well. It's actually part way into the, uh, the jacket. So um, in order to get this out, we're most likely going to have to take one of these wires and peel it through the jacket. So the first thing we need to do is make what we call a ring cut. What I mean by a ring cut is a cut that goes completely around the circumference of the cable and ends right back where it started from. Um, that's the way to make a proper ring cut. So in, a, in our example, the ring cut would actually be um, somewhere probably off the paper at the moment. Once we have that ring cut made, then what we have to do is access the neutral wire at the end of the cable as shown in the figure and pull it through the jacket. Now, I should mention that before we make a ring cut, um, I'd like to, to suggest that you always consider using the proper scoring tool for the application. I generally don't recommend using knives because knives are difficult to set to a specific depth. When you have a tool um, that's meant for the application, what we recommend doing is testing that tool on a scrap piece of cable, making sure that the, the blade is deep enough such that the jacket can be removed, but that it's not so deep that we actually cut into the neutral wires or whatever the metallic shield is. Whenever damage is made to a, a neutral wire or any metal shield, that particular shield loses some current carrying capacity as well as it loses mechanical strength, which could be a problem down the road for the installation. So what I'd like to do now is, is show you just a slightly different version of how to, to uh, remove the jacket. In this example, I'm still using an extruded to fill or encapsulated jacket, but I'm using a wire reel as a method to pull that wire through the jacket. Now up in the upper left corner, uh, I'm sorry, the upper right corner, I'm actually showing the use of a knife, which I sort of said previously I didn't recommend. The reason it's okay to use this here is because when you're just nicking the end of the cable here to, to get access to the neutral wire, um, if you do damage any of the underlying insulation, it'll be removed in future steps. So in this case, it's okay. With access to that neutral wire, the wire can actually be put through a small hole in the middle of, in the middle of the wheel, and then the wheel can be spiraled off the jacket back to the jacket cutback. How does the jacket actually get removed? Well, usually you can just peel it off once the wire has been pulled through. Many of the installers that I work with tell me that it's a little bit easier to grab that jacket near the ring cut versus grabbing it at the other end of the cable. But whichever way, you peel the jacket off and you expose the neutral wires underneath. Now once we have access to that, the metal shield, the neutral wires, um, we're going to need to move that out of the way because we have more work to be done underneath. So as you can see in this example, 
I'm actually showing that the neutral wires have been bent back um, among, back on themselves. And the way they've been bent is such that there's a relatively large bending radius to those wires. The reason I recommend using a large bending radius is because it minimizes the mechanical stresses on those conductors. Um, if you were working with an old cable that may have been buried in the ground for some time, you might find that the neutral wires are corroded and, and somewhat brittle. And the more brittle they are, the more prone they are to breaking when you, you pull them back on themselves like this. Um, another thing I'd like to point out here is when we, what we don't want to do is bend the neutral wires backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards many times because doing so, again, can fatigue the metal and possibly cause them to fail in the future. Okay, so we have our, our neutral wires out of the way. And now what's underneath? Well, what's underneath is called the insulation shield. Uh, many people refer to that as a semicon because most of the insulation shield materials used in the industry are actually semiconductive. When I first started in the cable industry, um, I heard the term semiconductive, and I instantly, instantly started thinking of PN junctions, diodes, transistors, and things like that. Um, when it relates to power cables, that's really not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a material that's slightly conductive. And the way, that, the way this is done is a material that is similar to the cable insulation itself is actually doped with carbon black particles in, the, in a proper engineered uh, concentration. Um, this small amount of carbon par particles allows that semiconductive material to be slightly conductive. So it has very limited current carrying capacity, but it will assume the potential of any metal that's, that it's touching. So this is one of the reasons why we recommend that the metal shield should stay in contact with the non-metallic shield as much as possible. Most of the insulation instructions for, uh, from the manufacturers will tell you how to terminate that metal shield, whether it be a concentric neutral wire, tape shield, et cetera. So we have access now to our semiconductive insulation shield. Um, there are a couple of ways that we can move forward here. I'm going to start out about talking about a, a, a way where the insulation shield is removed first, and then we take care of all the other layers. In a few slides, I'm going to talk about an alternate method where all of those layers are removed at once. So let's move forward um, with the understanding that we're going to talk about removing this semiconductive insulation shield first. So again, just like with the jacket, the first thing I recommend is that we take this tool that we're going to use to score the insulation shield and that we use it on a scrap piece of cable that's preferably um, just cut from the cable you're about to prepare. So once that, cable has, that tool has been properly set for the cable, the next thing we need to do again is to make a ring cut. A ring cut again is going to start at the appropriate cutback based on either the system owner's instructions or the manufacturer's installation instructions, and then spirals all the way around the circumference of the cable and, and lands right back to where it started from. Now, this particular tool um, can make a ring cut, just like I said. However, you can take this tool um, with the flick of a switch, and now the cable, as you spin it, will start to spiral off the, off the cable. As it does that, it, it puts a nice score mark in the insulation. The score mark, again, should be deep enough into the insulation shield so that the insulation shield can be removed, but it should not penetrate into the insulation that's below it. There are some other stripping tools that uh, all make a, a ring cut, but some of them actually make strips, and I think I have an example of a picture like that in a future slide. But in this case, with the insulation shield strip such that it spirals off, you can either peel it off with your fingers as shown, or you can use uh, pliers, whatever works for the installer. Here are some examples of things that we are not looking for when we're removing the insulation shield from a cable. If you think about what I said earlier about the ring cuts and how they need to start right back um, from where they need to end where they started, if you look in the, the, the figure in the upper right corner, you'll see that that's obviously not the case. It started in one place and ended in the other. So what we have there is an area where there's an ear right here. It's basically a sharp point. And what happens when we leave, if we were to leave this in an installed product, all the electrical field lines within the product will try to come back to the nearest grounded point, which would be right here. So you see a tremendous amount of electrical stress in this area. This almost always will, will lead to premature failure of the termination or joint. Here's a more subtle example of, of a similar problem. In this case, it appears that the ring cut was made uniformly and square, just like we wanted. However, when the last piece was stripped off the cable, 
a little ear was left behind. Just like in the upper figure, when we have a sharp point projecting into the insulation, most of those field lines are going to try to reach back to one common point instead of spreading out along this whole surface. So again, we're going to have an area with high electrical stress and an area where the product is more likely to fail prematurely. In this example, um, we've done the same thing as in the previous slide where we've tried to remove the insulation shield using a scoring tool. But the difference is the blade has been set too deep. So as you can see, we have all these spiral marks here. And these are actually cuts into the insulation. Um, the worst part about it, though, is if you look at the ring cut here, you can see that the tool has cut into the insulation right at the ring cut. In P1816, um, we say that if, uh, if the insulation is cut right at the ring cut, then the termination process cannot be repaired and the installer is to start over. So in this case, that's exactly what the installer would have to do because we don't consider this amount of damage to be repairable. At this point, though, I'd like to mention that whenever you're using one of these tools, what you're going to see sometimes in the cable insulation are pressure marks. Now, this is very similar to if you had a pad of paper and you wrote something on the top sheet, ripped the top sheet off, and looked underneath. What you still have are these pressure marks on the sheet below the one that you wrote on. The same thing happens in a cable. So if we had just pressure marks here, um, we consider that to be OK. If that cable warms up enough over its life, those pressure marks will actually come back out. OK, a little bit more about this process. So where we are at the moment is we've talked about removing the, the insulation shield uh, before removing the insulation. That's what we have over here in the upper right corner. The installer in this in this case is actually putting on an insulation stripping tool at the end, and that's this tool right here. What this tool will do is remove the insulation and the conductor shield from the conductor. So when the installer sets up this tool, somewhere down here the tool has to stop, and that's going to be where the insulation cutback dimension is. However, if that cutback dimension is a little bit further than expected, there is the potential for this tool as it's being spiraled around to get down to the insulation shield, the semicon layer, and it may rub up against it. Uh, there are some potential problems with that, and one of them is that you can delaminate the semiconductive material from the insulation. And whenever that happens, you have the potential for an air gap and partial discharge. Um, the other reason why sometimes installers don't like to remove um, prepare cables in this manner is that as you spiral this insulation tool down the side, if there's any debris or contaminants inside here, we can actually scrape up that insulation surface. But one of the advantages of this method is that if you think back to the previous step where we had to, to remove the insulation shield, what you'd notice is that when you're grabbing the insulation shield to be removed from the insulation, if you do nick any of this insulation here, um, it will be removed in the future. So it's not a problem. So with that in mind, I'd like to jump over to the other method. Um, and that would be what I'm showing in this figure, where the insulation shield, the insulation, and the conductor shield are all removed at the same time. So there are some advantages to that. But as you can see here, it's a different insulation stripping tool. But again, you have your cutback dimension. And as you spiral it off, the insulation shield, the conductor shield, and the insulation come off together. But the process is a little bit different. You start out with the same insulation shield scoring tool that was used previously. So this insulation shield is already scored for the right cutback dimension that the manufacturer's instructions have called for. This is removed. But then if you can think about the step I showed previously, where the end of that insulation shield has to be removed, there is potential to damage the insulation back here, and it will not be removed in the future. So those are some of the pros and cons of each of these methods. Again. If you leave that insulation shield on, you protect the insulation surface. And sometimes with the other method, that insulation stripping tool might bump up against that semiconductive layer and cause a problem. So with the pros and cons of each of the, those methods, I usually try to describe those to the installer. And then they're able to decide which is the best method based on the application. After a while, you're going to find that the installers know what the cutback dimensions are. They're going to know which way works better for what application. And I just let them do it that way. So whether or not um, we're going to remove that insulation shield first or do it all in one step, 
we still have to come back and remove the, enti the entire insulation that remains and the conductor shield that is bonded to it. So in the figure in the upper right over here, you can see that we have our cable insulation and we have our conductor shield. This is the blade of one of those insulation stripping tools that I showed you earlier. This blade, it's critical that this blade is set correctly, and again, we recommend setting this blade on a scrap piece of cable. The blade has to cut completely through the insulation. It also has to cut deep enough into the conductor shield here, the black material, so that it can actually strip freely from the conductor. But what we absolutely cannot do is set it so deep so that the blade actually nicks the wires of the conductor. And again, it's the same reason with concentric neutral cable. If you nick those wires, they lose current carrying capacity and they become mechanically weaker. So if that's done correctly, what you're going to find is that the insulation and conductor shield, or with the insulation shield still on it, if you chose to do it that way, strips cleanly from the conductor. So as you can see, our conductor here is aluminum, and we have no nicks or cuts around it, which tells us the blade did not hit the conductor. But if you look at the conductor shield and insulation coming off of that conductor, you'll be able to see that it's coming off cleanly with no debris left behind. This is what we're looking for when we remove uh, the insulation and the conductor shield from the conductor. Now, sometimes it happens where that blade isn't set quite deep enough. And as you can see in the figure on the right here, some of that conductor shield material remains on the conductor. And the question is, is that a problem? Well, if you envision sliding a conductor on the end of this conductor, um, it becomes pretty obvious that this conductor shield material uh, will get inside of that connection. And remember I said it's a semiconductive material, so it's not a true conductor. So it actually would function as an insulator when it comes to an application of a connector over it. So we really need to remove this. One way to remove that is to use a string. If you take the string and rub it back and forth, uh, heat will be generated. It'll actually cut right through that material, and then you can pull this off with the pliers. Um, sometimes, though, you might find that maybe a, just a little bit of this conductor shield material has been left on the conductor. Maybe, say, around where the bottom of that string is or a little bit less. Um, in a case like that, um, it's probably not a problem. Again, think of that connector coming on here, and would it actually interfere with the connection? Um, most likely it wouldn't. And you, you could potentially do more damage trying to remove this with a sharp knife than if you just left it there. Okay, after all those steps, um, what we're left with is shown here. We have our exposed metallic conductor. We have this area of insulation that I refer to as the insulation interface. Um, this interface, along with the similar part of the joint termination or separable connector that you're installing, forms the complete insulation interface. This insulation needs to be clean, smooth, and uniform for it to be able to do its job correctly, and that is to help relieve all the voltage stress at the end of this cable. Now remember right here, the insulation shield cutback, that's a, an area of very high stress. So any imperfections in this area are going, to be, are going to be greatly problematic if they're not addressed. And again, notice how square all the cuts are. This is a good example of what we're looking for um, when a cable is prepared properly. Okay. That takes care of talking about what, about what P1816 says about cable layers. But what I'd like to do is switch gears and talk about what makes an electrical connection good. Um, I had the pleasure of working with one of our uh, retired engineers for some time, and he kind of summed up cable prep in a couple of words. He said, well, a parts of the joint or termination that need to conduct electricity need to conduct well, and that's what our electrical connection section is all about. The other half of that equation is the insulation interface needs to insulate well, and that's what we'll be talking about after the electrical connection section. So when it comes to cables, the most common conductors are copper and aluminum. So I want to take just a few slides to go through some of the uh, properties of those metals. First of all, copper um, is a very good conductor. Okay, so for that reason, good connections are relatively easy to make. Um, all metals oxidize um, when exposed to the environment, so copper is no exception. Usually, copper oxidizes rather slow, but when it does start to oxidize, you'll usually see either green or black uh, areas on the conductor. Uh, that's your sign um, that there are, there's oxidation on a copper conductor. Now, if you compare copper oxide to aluminum, aluminum oxides, um, you, you'd learn that copper oxides are not that good of insulators compared to aluminum oxides. The other thing you'll notice is that copper oxides, um, 
They stick to the copper, but they don't stick that strongly. So they're relatively easy to remove. So for all these reasons, um, most copper connections do not use oxide inhibitors in them. So let's compare that to aluminum. First of all, I'd like to, to start out by talking about two different alloys of aluminum. Uh, 1350 is, is an electrical grade aluminum that's been around for a long time. Most utilities buy cables um, that are made from this type of an alloy. If you are working in an industrial or commercial type application that uh, needs to meet NEC requirements, National Electrical Code requirements, you'd most likely have to use an 8000 series aluminum. Now the 8000 series aluminum was created to make um, electrical connections with aluminum a little bit better than they are with the 1350 alloy. But whichever alloy you're using, the point I would like to make is that oxides begin to form instantly on aluminum. The rate at which they develop is dependent upon the ambient air temperature, the humidity, other factors like that. So knowing how quickly it forms on aluminum, um, it's important that we think about that when we're preparing the cable. Um, because you can't really see the oxides, we consider them to be transparent, you need to assume that any of these conductors um, that are made from aluminum have and that they need to be removed. So always wire brush aluminum conductors. These oxides stick tightly to the, the aluminum, so they're hard to remove, and they function as good insulators. So if you envision having a good insulator all around this conductor and putting a connector over it, you can see why you'd have a connection that wouldn't run as cool as it should. Um, one thing that we do to help counter the, the ill effects of aluminum is to use oxide inhibiting compounds. So I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a few slides. Okay, let's talk some, a little bit more about the connectors themselves. Whenever we're going to join aluminum to aluminum, we always want to use an aluminum or an alumina, aluminum alloy connector. Sometimes these aluminum connectors are also rated for installation as copper conductors, and when that's the case, we call them a dual rated connector. The connectors, the aluminum connectors, they may be bare, meaning there's no coating on the surface of the aluminum. They may be plated with tin, which is another metal that doesn't have so many problems with the oxides like aluminum does. Or they may be bare but coated with some kind of an oxide inhibiting compound. I've seen oils used on the outer surface of uh, aluminum type connectors. But one key thing that you're going to notice is any one of these connectors is going to have the oxide inhibiting compound inside. So you can see here um, an example of what that inhibitor looks like. I've seen some of the installers um, remove this material. They, for some reason, think uh, that this shouldn't be in there. Uh, that's actually not correct. It's in there for a reason. Don't remove it. Um, it's critical to making a good electrical connection. So when we're going to go ahead and brush that conductor to make sure we have a good connection with aluminum, uh, there's a couple ways we can do it. What we're showing over here is, is a, um, an example where we're going to wire brush it and instantly coat it with oxide inhibitor. That's what's recommended, to wire brush and instantly coat it with inhibitor. What I often tell our installers to do is um, wire brush it real good and then quick slide the connector on and spin it because that puts a nice coat of the oxide inhibitor all over the surface. In the bottom example here, we're actually showing a very extreme case where the, the strands have been corroded so severely that they need to be actually fanned out in order to be able to clean. With with most installations, it's not necessary to do this. Anything that's new, we would just recommend to brush the outer surface like is shown here. The type of brush that you would want to use is generally recommended is a stainless steel brush, although sometimes you may see a brass brush being used. Some more compression connector information. Uh, copper connectors should only be used on copper conductors. Never use copper on aluminum. What will happen is as that joint load cycles over time, the aluminum conductor will try to force its way out of the connection, and in the process, the connection will generate a lot more heat than it should and ultimately cause a thermal failure of the joint or termination. Um, remember I told you, showed you the picture of the aluminum connector with the oxide inhibitor in it. Copper uh, connectors generally do not contain inhibiting compounds, at least at medium voltages, uh, so there is a difference right there. Um, however, copper conductors, they can be bare or they can be tin plated just like aluminum. Now when it comes to wire brushing, we all agree that aluminum conductors should all be wire brushed. There is a little bit of debate in the industry as to whether or not it's recommended to brush copper. Um, so what I suggest you do is ask the system owner, um, do you want us to wire brush copper or not? 
what I usually recommend is if you see any visible evidence of uh, oxidation on copper, which would be the green or black colors that I referred to earlier, I would brush them. Um, the last kind of connector that I want to touch base on is what we call a bimetallic connector. And that's actually made when two different materials, in our case aluminum and copper, are actually welded together um, in the factory and they're used for future installations. I have an example of that in this slide. In the upper right corner, you'll see that I have a connector that's made with an aluminum barrel but with a copper lug. And again, this was welded together in a factory. This particular lug is used in a load break separable connector. Uh, it has a dual rating, aluminum and copper, so an aluminum conductor or a copper conductor could be inserted in the barrel. If you compare that to the, to the connector in the middle, um, you'll see that this is just a copper lug. It's only intended for copper conductors, but it is also another load break separable connector um, connection. In the upper left is an example of a tinned aluminum sleeve. So you can't really tell too easily when it's aluminum or tinned aluminum because the metals have roughly the same color. But the difference between this sleeve and this one is that this one is dual rated. The manufacturer has tested and, and approved this connector for installation on both aluminum and copper conductors. If you look at this connector on the bottom, it won't be obvious to what it is. This is actually an aluminum barrel that can be used on aluminum or copper conductors. But the actual pin portion of this is a copper rod that's been welded to the aluminum tin plated. The whole thing is tin plated, so it's difficult to tell what the materials actually are. So usually with these types of things, the installer just needs to know what he's working with. Now I mentioned that a lot of these connectors are plated, and things like lugs and all that can be plated as well. And sometimes there's a need to uh, clean that all up before you actually bolt your, your, your final connection to the equipment spade. So what I don't recommend with any of these tin plated um, products is to wire brush them. If you wire brush the tin plating, you risk actually removing the tin plating and exposing, say, the bare aluminum underneath. And we just recently learned that aluminum oxidizes very quickly, and those oxidizes interfere with good electrical connections. So what I recommend doing is just use a proof solvent, um, a clean wiper, and clean off all the surfaces. Uh, depending on your system's requirements, system owner's requirements, you may or may not have to add oxide inhibitor to any of those bolted connections too once that lug has been installed to the cable. Another point about oxide inhibiting compounds, if you were to buy a connector that's rated for an underground cable, you would most likely get um, a connector that's filled with a non-petroleum based inhibitor. Um, the, re the reason for that is if you use a petroleum based inhibitor and it got in contact with cable insulation, um, there is a potential for that uh, material to react with the insulation and actually cause it to swell or deform. So for that reason, um, we need to use a product that's compatible with the cable insulation. It will ultimately get on the insulation as we crimp that connector onto the conductor, but we need to have something that can be removed without damaging the insulation. So talk a little bit about this dye index concept. Um, I have a couple of slides on this, and the, the whole goal here is to make sure everybody understands how a proper electrical connection needs to be made with a compression connector. In the example on the right, I'm showing um, a connector that has an index requirement of 300. We'll talk a, a little bit more about that um, in, in the first or in the next couple slides. But for right now, just remember, you need to know what this index number is when you select the dies that you're going to use in your tool. Once you've taken a die with an index 300, and put it into the tool that you're going to use to make the compressions. The next step would be to uh, look at the manufacturer's recommended number of crimps. Um, you need to know the die that you're using in order to get the right number of crimps from the manufacturer. Once you have that all sorted out, um, and you go ahead and make your crimps on the connector, you'll end up with something like what we see in the lower right corner here. Um, I'd like to point out that where the two half dies come together, you're actually going to have a piece of metal that isn't, isn't crimped. Oftentimes in this area, um, you'll see that we get sharp edges and, and things that um, could be problematic for rubber type products. So whenever you have flash in areas like this, or anywhere for that matter, it's important to use a file and break those down. You don't really necessarily need to, sh to uh, make them smooth with the surface of, of the connector, but you do need to make them uh, smooth again. Now in this example, you can see we have the two dies coming together here, then it's here, then it's here, then it's here. Uh, so I can tell just by the uh, 
the rotating of those dies, that this particular installer rotated the crimps 90 degrees. It's also okay to rotate the tool 180 degrees. You know, the tool's coming this way, then the tool's coming that way, then the tool's coming this way. The whole goal of rotating these crimps is to keep that connector straight, like it is shown here. What we don't want is for that connector to start looking like a banana, you know, to start curving up like this. Um, if you think about the termination or joint that's going to be applied over this connector, if we have an area, a bend, that this thing is, that the product is trying to conform to, you may find that the surface on the back side is pretty tight, but you might actually have air pockets on the other side if this connector were, were banana. So that's the reason why we want to rotate crimps, and the goal is to keep it straight. Also consider that if you're going to use a dialless tool, um, that the dialless tool is rated for this particular connection. A few other things about making these crimps. Um, whenever we're doing a termination, like a lug for example, the installer should always start near the lug, um, right below the termination, I'm sorry, right, right below the neural mark here, and work towards the cable. So if the lug is over here, the installer starts here, rotates his crimps, and goes down until he um, finishes filling that crimped area. If this were a joint, um, if we had um, half the connector this way and half the connector that way, the recommended practice is to start you know, at one side or the other of the middle and work all the way out on both sides. Okay, back to the die index concept. Here's an example of a chart um, that I referred to in the past. Um, here's our index 300. So if you follow this row all the way through the chart, you'd see that we have several different catalog numbers of dies that are all in the family of die index 300. And these different die catalog numbers are used in different tools. So we have, you know, one die that's used in four tools, for example, but then these other tools have separate dies for them. Um, these are all approved for use on the connector that I showed in the previous slide. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that these dies are not necessarily of the same width. These tools have different output forces, so they can crimp um, a connector more or less depending on their output force. So the more powerful tools can go with dies that are thicker and use less crimps, and the less powerful tools need narrower dies and more of those crimps. So that's why I said before, always refer to the manufacturer's installation instructions to get the proper number of crimps for the die that you're using. Here's a common question that I often get. Um, it has to do with, as you crimp a connector onto a conductor, you're going to see that that connector grows. Um, sometimes it can grow as much to a half an inch, sometimes more if it's a really large conductor. As that happens, you can envision all that inhibitor inside, of, assuming this is an aluminum connector. Um, as you crimp each one of these, a little bit of that inhibitor gets forced out. Ultimately, what happens is it all comes out at the end here. All the excess inhibitor comes out at the end. Um, and remember that the inhibitor um, should be compatible with the insulation, meaning it's okay for it to contact it. But inside that inhibiting compound are usually metal abrasive and conductive particles and they're helped to assist with removal of those aluminum oxides. Um, because there's conductive particles in there, we don't want any of this material getting along our insulation interface, which we'll talk about in the next section. So what I recommend is a very small gap in here, maybe an eighth of an inch or less. Um, that's enough room for an installer to, to, to clean out the material and make sure we, we don't get it on the end here. If we happen to be installing a copper connector, you know, we can even go smaller because uh, we don't have any inhibitor in, in those connectors. What I don't like to see is this butted right up against the end of the insulation because as this, this cable uh, load cycles, um, we don't really want the metal forcing itself into the insulation. So I usually like a very small gap in that area. Another point about the air gap is that any place we have in a product um, like this, an air gap, we introduce an area where uh, that conductor is going to run a little bit warmer than each side of it. And that's because air is a pretty good insulator. That's another reason to make it a very small air gap in there, to minimize the effects of that slightly, um, a slight addition of heat in that area. Okay, that sums up our, uh, our section on making reliable electrical connections. So I'm going to move ahead now and talk a little bit about the insulation interface. How do we prepare that for a reliable installation? My first example um, is actually from a, a four-conductor cable um, that I experienced out in the field. And if you, as you separate this cable uh, from the other cables in the assembly, 
what you notice is that um, where it was pressed against the other cables kind of flattened out. So we don't have that nice circular cross section that we're looking for. Um, so if you can picture a uh, cold shrinkable product, for example, trying to squeeze itself down on this cable, rather than it coming down uniformly all around, it's going to be a little bit higher pressure here and a little less in the middle, a little bit higher here. And in these areas where the pressure is a little bit less, um, it is possible for the product to start developing some electrical tracking along that interface. So um, keep that in mind. We're looking for a circular cross section. In a case like this, um, if we had, to, if we experienced this out in the field, there is a way to, to restore this cable to a near circular uh, cross section, and that would be to uh, once the insulation is exposed and cleaned properly, use a little bit of uh, heat and heat this material up. What happens with uh, thermal set materials such as EPR or XLPE is once they're heated up and they get warm enough, they like to go back to their original state. So that would be, in the case of a cable, a circular cross section. Okay, this is a common question too. Um, should the insulation be sanded or not? If you, if you rewind uh, many years ago, we didn't really have strippable shields. Um, the, the, the shield material tended to stick to the cable insulation, or maybe we even had taped insulation shields, and that, that material just stuck on it all the time, and it had to be removed. But if we're buying cable um, to today's AEIC specifications or ICEA standards for strippable shields, um, there really is no reason to sand afterwards unless you've actually caused some minor damage to the insulation. So that's the recommendation when it comes to strippable shields. Try to prepare the cable so that you don't damage the insulation, and then there's no reason to sand. Um, you always have to clean the insulation when you're done um, using a lint-free wiper and a proof solvent, and I have a few slides to go through that a little bit later. But if conductive particles are present, um, like they obviously are in our example on the right here, it'll be necessary to use some sanding to get those off. Um, I mentioned that some of the older cables um, had insulations that were shields that were bonded to the insulation. Again, that would have to be removed or the, or the termination will not function properly. So how do we do that? Well, what's recommended is to use a number 120 grit or finer aluminum oxide sandpaper. Now remember how I said aluminum oxide is a pretty good insulator? It's also very tough, so it actually makes a really good product to use on sandpaper to prepare cables. Those aluminum oxide particles, if they happen to be left behind for some reason, um, they aren't really that conductive, so the product may still uh, do just fine. But anyhow, you would take that sandpaper and you would sand evenly around the cable, and I have a slide to show that in a moment here, um, and you'd, you'd loosen up all these conductive particles and get them off. You don't want to sand so much that you fall below the minimum outside diameter of that insulation for the pro I'm sorry, below the minimum OD for that product. Uh, recommended diameter over insulation. If you do, the product may not have enough um, inward, inward hoop stress for the, the accessory to perform properly. And this is the way we recommend sanding. Um, as you can see here, the installer has the sandpaper, it's a 120 grit, and he's going to go back and forth like he's shining his shoe. Then he's going to do the other side, then he's going to do the top, then he's going to do the bottom. So we're trying to get a nice even amount of sanding all around the cable so that we don't end up with an example like over here. In this case, uh, the installer obviously was trying to sand out um, a mark that was way too deep into the insulation that was not repairable. Um, the accessories of today will not, even as good as they are, they will not perform satisfactory on a cross-section of cable like this. Another common question, well, if I sand the insulation, doesn't it make the, uh, the product perform poorly because it's not as smooth as it was before? Well, that's a good question, because if you look in the upper right, this is an example of uh, polyethylene material, cross-link polyethylene material that was not sanded. It looks very smooth. If you look at the bottom, you know, one that was sanded um, with the proper you know, the recommended sandpaper, you can see it's, it's rougher than it was before. Um, but the end result here is that manufacturers test their products uh, with insulations that have been sanded. And what they find is that those products uh, still perform satisfactorily. They pass industry standards such as IEEE 48, 404, 386. So um, it's OK to sand if you need to, but if you don't have to, we don't recommend that you do it. Um, basically, if you don't sand the polyethylene insulation, you'll probably end up with a product that has higher breakdown strength. But either way, sanded or not sanded, they all meet the industry standard requirements. Now, how do you clean that insulation? Whether you 
Whether you sand it or not, we always recommend that you clean the insulation. So say you had a strippable shield, you got the shield off um, easily, nothing stuck behind, there's no damage to the insulation underneath, you still have to clean the insulation. So we recommend using an approved solvent for that. Either you apply the solvent to a lint-free wiper, or some of the manufacturers today have these pre-moistened towelettes that you can use. Either one is fine. What we recommend, though, is that you wipe from the end of the insulation this way towards that semiconductive shield. We do not recommend that you start at the semiconductive shield and move towards the end of the insulation. The reason for that is, you know, we're going to put this solvent on, on, the, on the rag, and the solvent's purpose is to try to get these the particles and debris to go in a solution and stick to, to the towel. So if we touch the insulation shield and start to get in there and pull back this way, that solvent's going to pull those conductive carbon black particles out of the, the insulation shield and drag them along the insulation interface. So then we're going to have an insulating medium with a bunch of little conductors on it. That's not what we're looking for. That's why we recommend starting right here, where you're not likely to pick up any conductive particles, and clean towards the insulation shield. Once the rag uh, touches the shield, you just lift it off and throw it away and get a new one, and do that all around the circumference of the cable. Another thing I've seen out in the field is the use of scouring pads. These are the types of pads that are often used to clean uh, dishes, for example, at your house. Um, we do not recommend using those either. First of all, um, they, they are much too coarse for the application. Second of all, you can see all the particles uh, that are left behind in this microscopic view. Third strike against them is a lot of these particles, um, they can be metallic and therefore conductive, making um, your work here with, with a lint-free wiper to get all that off much more challenging. On the last steps, uh, once you've got your cable termination, for example, all prepared, uh, make sure it's mounted securely so that you have all the electrical clearance you need. And that metallic shield, it's important that either you ground that for the system owner's requirements, or if it happens to be a cable end that's not supposed to be grounded, that you properly terminate it. If you had just installed a joint, uh, make sure that in the directory application, for example, make sure you backfill it with clean material. Um, this is material that doesn't have large rocks, glass, other kind of sharp things in it that may actually damage the, the joint. And the, the other key to this is make sure that it's compacted well. Um, if, if the soil that is used to bury a joint or a cable, for that matter, is not compacted well, there's all kinds of air pockets in the soil. And remember earlier when I said air pockets and joints tend to make that part of the joint or termination run warmer. The same is true um, with the soil. Air pockets make the cable in them run warmer because the heat can't escape. The last thing I'd recommend is that you consider testing the cable system for partial discharge or another electrical test um, if it's critical um, and you want to make, make sure you did a great job on your cable prep. PD testing is probably the best way to do it. Okay, I'm going to move forward to our, our last section here. I'll make a few recommendations, cover some of our key takeaways, and then we'll have a few questions. I mentioned earlier in the webinar that I had um, to actually go through this whole process once a number of years ago. And once I gathered all the information that I could find, um, nowadays you would just find that in P1816 when it's uh, finally published probably um, within a few months. Um, I would take all that information and update your construction standards. In, in my utility, we have a general procedure for joints, a general procedure for terminations. And I put all that information in each procedure. Um, the next thing I'd recommend is to take a look at all your training documents. Um, some of you may not have any. I really didn't have any cable prep type documents at all in our company. It was just uh, taught verbally. So I put together a document that has all that information in it. Um, take a look at what your training center is doing. Are these important, critical cable prep uh, ideas discussed in those, in those uh, training sessions. And if not, make sure they're added. And make sure you train not only your internal installers, but any contractors or external folks that you might be using. Um, we actually went pretty far with our training program. We not only trained all of our installers, we trained some of our supervisors so that they would be more aware of what the installers are supposed to do. And the testing that we did was not only a written test where we asked true, false, and multiple choice questions, we actually had each installer make a joint determination while somebody who was knowledgeable uh, graded them. And then once that was done, we had all of those products electrically tested for partial discharge. And once that was all done, um, we actually certified it 
these installers for uh, doing work on our system. Okay, so let's review some of the key takeaways from today's webinar. Uh, first, even though there's some great information in P1816, it's intended to be supplemental to some of the critical information in either the system owner's construction standards and or the manufacturer's installation instructions. Um, with all those instructions, make sure you double check all those cutback dimensions and then make your final cut. Uh, we always recommend the use of cable prep tools over knives. And remember that final cut, it's got to be square so that in the end when all the layers are stripped off the cable so that that conductor actually is fully inserted in the connector. Uh, remember that when you're making these connections, they need to conduct electricity with a very low resistance. So if it's an aluminum conductor cable or a copper one that has obvious signs of corrosion, I recommend wire brushing it and always use that oxide inhibiting compound on aluminum. Make sure that the die index number on that connector, assuming it's a compression connector, matches the die index number on the die. And make sure you apply the number of crimps recommended for that tool and die combination. The other half of it, again, the insulating part of that product needs to insulate well. So make sure that that insulation interface is clean, uniform, and smooth. And remember, whether or not you sand, you still have to clean that insulation. So take an approved solvent um, with a wiper and wipe from the end of that insulation towards the semiconductive shield. And if it's a critical insulation, consider having it electrically tested um, before it's placed into service. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer um, for any questions that there may be. Thanks, Mike. We have actually gotten a handful of questions from our audience. The first one being, where did you get that really cool conical neutral puller? <laughs> That's a good question, and that tool has been around, I think, longer than I've been around. And I'm not exactly sure where it came from, um, but I will have to take a look, and I can probably get back to the person who asked the question. Okay, fair enough. Thanks for that. Uh, the next question is from Don, and he asks, what precisely is the best way to clean up the gunk between the end of the compression connector and the butt end of the insulation? Well, that's a good question. Uh, what I, the, the way I see our installers do that is they, they usually have a series of these lint-free wipers that they use to clean the cable insulation. They'll generally take it, fold it in half, and then kind of hold it, you know, around the cable between their two, with two hands, and just kind of loop around almost again like you're shining a shoe, because when that's folded in half like that, you can get the wipers into a fairly small area. So then they, they wipe it around and get as much out of there as they can, and then they clean off the insulation. So that's the way I'd recommend uh, that an installer do it. Okay. Tom asks, does it matter how close the neutrals are to a termination? Uh, I would say in general, yes. Um, I've had some slides where I've, I've um, tried to indicate that we want the metallic portion of the conductor, I'm sorry, of the insulation shield be in contact with the semiconductive portion of the insulation shield as much as possible. Um, in P1816, um, they recommend having that metal shield within two inches of the product. And we realize that, you know, in some of these applications, they do need to be separated at some point. Um, but what we don't want to see is that, let's say it's a, a live front polymer termination or a, a load break separable connector. What we don't want to see is those neutral wires strip back like three or four feet to ground level um, because now all the charging current is forced to go through the, the non-metallic insulation shield and it's really not intended to perform that way. Um, the other problem with stripping that shield back so far is that in the event of some kind of a failure of the termination itself, um, you don't have a good solid low impedance ground path nearby. So that fault might not be detected right away, which could lead to further equipment damage and other problems. That's great information. We have another question from Mike who asked if you could elaborate more upon the two aluminum, pardon me, aluminum alloys you mentioned, the 1350 and the 8000, and what are the pros and cons of each? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, the, the big pro, I guess, of the 8000 series aluminum is it's supposed to be easier to to uh, connect and have less problems with uh, connection-related issues. I understand that that, at that alloy actually uh, was, was created based on some problems that, that occurred when the residential market was, was introduced to aluminum building wires for residential construction. So the big pro to using the 8000 series uh, aluminum is that it's better connectability versus the 1350. 
And as you could imagine, um, the con against it is that it costs more and it's not readily available. And so, like I said earlier, that's why uh, most utility type medium voltage cable applications that I'm aware of are using the 1350. So it's, it's because um, it's less expensive and a lot of the testing has been done on that 1350 alloy already. Great, thanks. It looks like we have time for one more question. And this is from Lisa who asks, how do you know when the strands have enough corrosion to merit fanning the strands to clean between them? If the extruder conductor shield keeps the outside of the strands fairly clean, is it okay to peek under a single outer layer strand to get a look-see at the strand interstice? Okay. Um, well, normally when, when I see, let's take aluminum for example, when I see aluminum, uh, brand new aluminum cable, um, as I said before, the, the oxides are transparent, so you really you kind of like see right through them and you get that nice shiny metal look. If you've actually had a case where the conductor strands have corroded, like if you had standing water in the strand, what tends to happen is you actually start getting not just a surface oxide layer, but you actually get true corrosion where the, the material is actually breaking down. And when aluminum corrodes, what you often see is an aluminum powder and I think that's a combination of a, a couple of different aluminum oxides. Uh, but when you see white powder, um, that's an indication that the, the strands are corroded much more than what I consider to be normal. If you experience that out in the field, I'd suggest you contact the system owner um, and see if they are comfortable with you even uh, terminating that cable. Uh, as far as cleaning them, um, yeah, you can fan those out and take a peek at them. Um, but if they are that corroded with lots of aluminum powder in them, um, remember what I said about neutral wires, that it applies to the conductors as well. The more corroded they are, the more brittle they get. And as you try to bend them out a little bit, you, you, you do have that slight risk of, of breaking them. Um, so the more corroded they are and the more you bend them increases the risk of breaking them. So I would just exercise some caution with that. Generally with copper conductors, um, you don't see so much corrosion that's so severe um, that you can't deal it. At least I haven't. Uh, that can't be uh, cleaned up and reused. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for taking time to speak with us today. And thanks to everyone joining us. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this. And um, you'll look forward to future Masters of Reliability webinars. Again, thanks a lot. Thank you.